He has specialised in the area of uh, anxiety disorders and particularly OCD. Um, he has um, driven the um, culture of St. Pat's since he's really arrived here in 2002. Um, I think when you look back on Jim's career, um, I think people will particularly note what he's achieved in St. Pat's since he's become medical director. Um, those of you who know our hospital will know the sort of challenges that we face every day, um, and particularly the challenges we faced um, three or four years ago. Um, mental health in Ireland is changing significantly. There's new policies, uh, there's, new, there's a new direction. And within that landscape, it's easy for an organisation like St. Pat's to get lost, to lose its direction. Um, Jim has brought a particular um, special form of management to St. Pat's. Uh, he has driven and is very passionate about the role of psychiatry in mental health. And yet he's ma managed to marry that with the concepts of recovery, the concepts of empowering um, service users, and the concept of uh, merging community-based mental health care with campus-based or hospital-based care. Um, Jim is passionate about mental health, and anybody who knows him will know that he he is passionate about the people that he works with. Uh, he cares about all of them individually. He works tremendously hard to make sure that, uh, that there are good outcomes for those people. And he's transferred that passion into the work he does here in St. Pat's as medical director. Uh, he has led by example. He has been a tremendous support to the board of the hospital. And we've achieved many things uh, within our strategy, Mental Health Matters. And Jim is a core player in that because he's brought that personal passion and commitment to ensuring that that strategy is achieved. Um, the difficulty tonight was that, as we all know, Jim is a quiet guy. Um, it was difficult to get him to agree to this. Um, we're concerned that he'd be able to speak for the allotted time. <laughs> there may be some sort of vacant pauses here or there, but I think uh, we, um, we know that Jim is going to give a very interesting talk. I'm delighted tonight to be able to introduce uh, Professor Jim Lucy, our medical director. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think we have to take that introduction um, at, 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 at face value. Um, most of you know me well, and uh, I can only say thank you for the hyperbole and all the generous co uh, comments. Um, and uh, move swiftly on. I was sweating, I, I will admit. <laughs> Um, look, it's a very great uh, privilege for me to be uh, able to speak to you today about uh, uh, two topics I, I, I love, and uh, to have an audience that is willing to come and listen and, and hopefully share in what will be a discussion about uh, the important matters of the mental health service, of uh, education, and, uh, and the advance of, of psychological medicine, uh, and, and to set that in the context of some history. Today is a very special day, as we all know. It is the 11th day of the 11th month, and soon it will be the 11th hour. This is Remembrance Day. And uh, lest we forget, St. Patrick's has its part in that history. It uh, has been the place where revolutions took place nearby. It has uh, been uh, central to the 1798 and uh, subsequent land wars, local, local insurrections, and world wars, have all actually in their way sometimes quite closely impinged on us. And throughout that extraordinary history, the history or the, the arc of the history of psychological medicine has also uh, been seated here. So I'm going to try and, and, and quickly um, go through much of that. Um, Michael Gill sent out a very nice um, uh, email to uh, people encouraging them to come to my talk because he said it would be replete with jokes. Um, no pressure, of course. Um, uh, but uh, entertainment was to be guaranteed. Um, I prepared this talk while, in fact, I have been myself, uh, thankfully I'm all better, but I've been quite unwell for the last month, and so much of this talk was prepared in a personal delirium. But, uh, but on the other hand, <coughs> I, 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 I am grateful to the many colleagues and friends who supported me during that time, and who also nuanced and directed some of this talk. Um, uh, Michael Gill himself, technical doctor, and John Cooney, who are here, uh, gave me the kind of steer that I think um, the balanced judgment of history required. 
Uh, I do want to say that I take full responsibility for the uh, nature of the talks, the omissions and commissions of uh, dereliction of one kind or another are, that are in it are entirely my own. And uh, I am standing here taking the risk of Abe Lincoln uh, and fully conscious of it. The reality is, though, that we can look at some source material. And I want to make particular thanks to Mr. Andrew Whiteside, who is our hospital archivist and is a genuine academic who did look at source material in relation to the relationship between St. Patrick's and Trinity. And uh, uh, there is interesting data to be had. I more lazily looked at the work of other good scholars, uh, particularly drew from the work of Professor Coakley, who's here, uh, but also mostly placed emphasis on the really seminal work and authoritative work of Elizabeth Malcolm, whose work was a great achievement of the celebrations around the 250th anniversary of the hospital, and a, a book that is an indication of the wisdom of the governors who commissioned it. There's some other uh, more subjective and perhaps less reliable uh, notes and others about the general history of the development of mental health and health hospitals, which I drew from. I want to put to you, as I go to the more earnest element of this talk, uh, a proposal. I want you all to imagine that you have the capacity to deliver the ideal mental health service. Whether you're on the receiving end or the delivery end, all of us, in fact, ultimately, <coughs> will want to know what is the ideal mental health service. We could even extend it beyond the terms of this lecture and ask, what is the ideal health service? I would put it to you that it would not be much different than one which encompasses these zones. It must have a model, a model which is consistent with a mission and vision and a strategy to meet that model. It must have an organization which is a structure with governance that is rigorous, that recognizes the rewards that are due and can ensure the responsibilities that are needed. And, uh, and principally and crucially, it must have a culture that sustains <coughs> those models, that keeps that organization, that has an ethos and a, re a reflection, a commitment to the values of academia. I'm going to put it to you that St. Patrick's Hospital, through its association with Trinity and its role in the nation, has had the privilege of working through over 250 years on this site, a generation that has gone through these elements of model. It started boldly, wonderfully, with the vision of Swift. It went through ropey times, which I'll talk to you about, and res was resurrected as much part and through the input of Trinity College think he was just wonderful. I just The more I read about him, the more I like him. Uh, I particularly like the fact that so many after he died wanted to tear him apart and describe him as a misanthrope and as, as somebody who was mad. He was declared mentally unsound in the last three years of his 78 years, but there's every evidence to believe that that was to do with a very clever way of managing his, his remaining few remaining pounds. He left uh, an estate of 10,000 to this hospital, his entire wealth. He says in his epitaph, which is here in the Latin in, his, in the cathedral, that we should go out and try and imitate him in his commitment to liberty. This is a national patriot. And his patriotism was ultimately, but all through his life, about a commitment to mental health. And that was extraordinary for his time. Yes, he was a Trinity man. He went to Trinity College at the age of 14. Um, his detractors afterwards uh, described him as a difficult student. My goodness, he was a boy. His, uh, he was the posthumous son of a poor lawyer raised by a family he was set to. He was effectively homeless. Um, and uh, he didn't really attend to the course given him. And I'm, we, we should all be grateful that he didn't. But he graduated seven years later. He became a doctor of Trinity College in his early 30s. But we remember him probably in public matters now for his great work his wrote Gulliver's Travels, which is often dismissed now as a children's story. But it's in every bookshop, in every library of the world. 
It's in every manifestation of the media here. Jack Black has apparently done a recent version of it. But it's been in a musical, it's been children's books, it's been in cartoons. But really as an excoriating criticism of the human... Uh, dismissed him. During his lifetime, his influence was probably greater than Samuel's. But nonetheless, at the time, he cared less for these things. He was in uh, the thick of the development of Trinity College uh, Medical School, uh, and this was not a doctor. Uh, he met with his friends, Delaney and others, at Delville, and their view of medicine was, and let's be clear about this, and it's appropriate at the time, perhaps, but it was a philosophical one not the current notion of psychological or scientific. But it's fair to say that there would be and would not have been a Trinity College Medical School over the last 100 years had there not been Swift 250 years ago. He was one of the first governors of the Foundling Hospital, now St. James's University Hospital across the road. But the fact is that when it was founded, the idea indeed of a Foundling Hospital was as much Swift's as anybody else's. The founding hospital map can be shown um, in, in certain you know, reproductions as having at the back of it, attached to it, a ward known as a bedlam. Swift had no time for attaching bedlams to general hospitals. But he was part of the development of general hospitals. Indeed, he was one of the first governors of Dr. Stevens Hospital. And he went out of his way to see uh, ultimately, that this hospital was adjacent to Dr. Stevens Hospital. There's a long history of his difficult battle for the choice of a site of hospital because he was not prepared to place it in the context of a profit-making private hospital, which there were existent. He wasn't prepared to put it as an attachment of a general hospital, which existed. He definitely didn't want it to be part of a prison where mental illness was commonly placed. And he had objections to it being anywhere near where fevers were treated. So he had a unique vision of an independent, dedicated mental health facility. And ultimately, in the end, he asked the governors, his friends of Stevens, could they portion some of their site out to make this hospital happen? But there would be no Meath Hospital, for example. Meath was built on his vineyard. Uh, the, the existence of the feds, as they became, was as much part of his contribution, extraordinary influence, that he had. And yet... It's for Patrick's that he's remembered by those who choose to remember him at all. And his motto is, I think, comically misunderstood. He referred to himself throughout his life by uh, pseudonyms of the words for speed. So Festina is swift. Festina lente is not make haste slowly, it's make swift. And he asks us to make his vision, to build his vision. And that is what we've tried to do for more than two and a half centuries. Why was it so important? Well, he had been a chaplain at uh, Bedlam. He sought that role in London, and he was appalled by what he saw, not because he was any more kindly than anybody else. He was clearly irascible and difficult to know. Um, on the other hand, his sensibility was informed by a different intellectual and philosophical position from those that were around him. Stigma, as we know, has not become a new thing. It's not something new. Stigma has always been there. And the stigma of mental illness was absolutely rife in the 17th and 18th centuries because reason, as Elizabeth Malcolm have said, reason was considered to be the cardinal defining attribute of humankind. And thus, in losing one's reason, the madman lost his claim to be treated as a human being. The prime model for medical uh, illness was in these times of the Enlightenment and the discovery of mechanics was seen as hydraulic. Nerves were seen as hollow pipes filled under pressure by fluids composed of the subtlest of bodily particles. Graphic and easy to visualize, it pictured depression and disorientation as corporal plumbing <coughs> failures. How many have a model like this now? It's probably not that far from what we have now. 
If tubes became clogged, if, for instance, heavy diet or low habits were indulged, the fluids grew sluggish, causing heaviness and lowness. Certainly Samuel Johnson afterwards described, and many others, as Swift as becoming mad because of an indulgence in um, heavy diet and low living. Um, I doubt it's the case. Certainly, medicine at the time offered no relief from this kind of inhumane treatment. <coughs> Furious madmen are sooner or later more certainly cured by punishment, by hard usage in a straight room, than by physic and medicines. Let their diet be slender and not delicate, their clothing coarse, their beds hard, and their handling be severe and rigid. Just, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit far from the recovery model, I think. But it was the prevailing medical view, and what was wonderful about Swift was that he didn't see that he had to take that view. He did not uh, sh shrink from his intellectualism. He, uh, philosophers like John Locke and the others challenged the prevailing view, but he, he actually stood out and said no. So when he discussed these matters with other members of Trinity Medical School as it developed, he took an independent view, and he was wonderful at maintaining that. For all the other options for mental illness that existed were being tried. It has to be said that around this time there were very, very few hospitals in Ireland. Uh, the collapse of the monasteries that had happened, say, in, our, in, 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 in the UK might have been the reason why there weren't hospitals here. Maybe the mon monastic contribution or whatever uh, hadn't been here or had been lost as well. But for whatever reason, at the turn of this particular century, there were very few places for treatment or care of any illness, really. And public health statistics, insofar as we can understand them, really put the danger of living in Dublin uh, as at very, very high. It was a perilous place to, to be born, to go up, to live. Probably more perilous than a city in, in India at the time. And it was thought that, really, we should build workhouses and put the mentally ill there. Uh, we should build uh, attachments to workhouses and make our own bedlams. And uh, we should encourage people to mind them, their mentally ill at home uh, and see what we could do. And those who had wealth were encouraged to use the option of going to private asylums, where Swift saw their wealth being bled dry, as he said. So he rejected this and said, madmen do not appear to have lost the faculty of reasoning. But having joined together some ideas very wrongly, they mistake them as truths. Anyone can fall into madness. The mentally ill are not less human by virtue of a loss of reason. Rather, they reason wrongly. There's a thin line between the great and the successful of the world and between those and the inmates of Bedlam. So then he gave the little wealth he had to build a house for fools and mad and showed by one satiric touch. No nation wanted it so much. The kingdom he had left his debtor. I wish it soon may have a better. We quote these lines so often in the hospital here, and we think about them probably too little. He saw it as a national effort. This has been dismissed and described by our, our other <coughs> critics as being a joke on Ireland, and indeed it may be. But actually it's not. It's about a societal notion where he sees mental health as being relevant to the collective society. And so in that, philosophically, he sees no man, no human, as being truly fulfilled unless they have a societal relationship. It's not a mockery in Ireland. It's about a statement about the nature of humanity. He's different, for example, from philosophers like Hobbes, who regarded society as being irrelevant and people as being actually having an individual private reality and society being distinct from that. He sees us as having a national significance because he sees human beings as being societal and their mental health as being a commitment and a duty of that society. So let's look at Swift's model. Yes, he said, we need to have an independent service for the mentally ill. If we put them into bridewells, if we put people in the home and see them neglected, if we, so on and so on, it has to be independent. He saw it as humane. And he saw the only way forward as, as charitable. He rejected the model of the private hospital. He defined an organizational structure, a governance. He told the governors to seek a royal charter, and he instituted strict guidelines as to rewards and responsibilities. We have a number of slides which I haven't shown you about these, um, but uh, they might have fulfilled the demand to have the jokes in this talk that Michael suggested I should have. There are the ones about the responsibilities of the medical director, the rewards in which he is due to have, the fresh eggs in the morning, and the uh, 
strict instructions that he should not become too proximal to the director of nursing, um, and so on and so on. I'm talking about a prescriptions for behavior, responsibilities, and pr proprieties that he made quite clear. He made it quite clear what the wage level of the hospital should be and how it should be uh, determined in relation to the overall capacity of the hospital to deliver its service. And he said the culture shall be effectively a humane and rights-based one. He was adamant that it was to be a non-denominational hospital. The only group, faith-based faith -based group, he had no tolerance for were what he called fanatics. Um, but if you weren't a fanatic, he wanted you to get the best service. He had a philosophical view and certainly a highly intellectual view about the role of mental health care. And he really gave us, in short, the human rights view of mental health care. When you think of our current mental health situation, which has many strengths, it has to be said that the first time we've had a mental health act which is human rights based in this society is 2008. 2006 it came in. We have not had a human rights focus in terms of mental health until very, very recently. Swift had it so long ago. And yet, the hospital fell into decline. It thrived in the first 50 years after huge difficulties and wonderful work was done by many people whose history I have short-circuited here, people like Emmett and the others. But it thrived in the first century by very close adherence to the guidelines and the structures that Swift outlined. It declined in the second half of the 1800s for a number of factors. Elizabeth Malcolm is quite clear that it declined because it lost sight of its own mission, vision, and principles. It was content to become an asylum. She also acknowledges that it lost sight of it because a number of financial factors, terrible privations in, the, in society of Ireland at the time, also particular strictures the government laid down a rule that the hospital could not charge certain amounts of monies to people and limited its capacity to raise income and then denied it grants from Parliament. And so the hospital went into great financial difficulty. Unfortunately, the hospital decided that the prudent thing to do was to reduce the amount of straw in the bedding to limit the number of attendants and to uh, limit the quality of the activity we did. Easy to see now, that was the wrong choice. But how quickly that will become the kind of difficult choice we have to make as our own health services, and our, particularly uh, our, our mental health services, have to make harsh choices between costs and benefits, between our mission and our capacity to deliver that mission. It's easy to see that when Dr. Leeper came here in 1899, he found a lamentable state. Leeper was an extraordinary man, and his appointment was largely due to the influence of the Trinity College members of the Board of Governors, one particular man who made a huge step and chose him. He was an, ex an unusual fellow. Um, he was a GP and a surgeon, not a psychiatrist. Uh, he is described as having been a really super shot, a great man at hounds. These are things that I was asked when I was interviewed here as to how, <laughs> how and, and uh, I, I of course told them the truth, that I was an excellent man at hounds, um, uh, which, which was one of the shorthands that I, I, I've got away with. Um, having said that, I have, and, and my predecessors haven't been in the terrible position of finding what Leeper found, a hospital so neglected that it resembled Hogarth's portrayal of Bedlam in an earlier century. I used some of the pictures of Hogarth's depictions of that awful state. The mere housing, feeding, and protection formerly given to lunatics is utterly short of what is demanded from those whose duty it is to medically tend the sufferers of mental illness. So here's a huge statement, a re-looking re re at the vision, because he's quoting Swift's. Swift's view was that we should be tending the mentally ill. He was, you know, a 19th century doctor. This famous picture taken from the foyer of Philadelphia Medical School describes the kind of aloof empirical doctor of the time, uh, influenced by what, the findings at, uh, at anatomy, but really with relatively little remedy and only the capacity to be sanguine in the face of all the challenge that presents itself. And yet Leeper did not stand back as, as he might have done. He decided that we were going to transform St. Patrick's from an asylum for the maintenance of the mentally ill to a hospital for their treatment and cure. Extraordinary bold thing to do. 20 years before Irving Gottman was even born, we had decided that the asylums were over. 80 years before planning for future, we made a decision that though there is little public sympathy for the insane in Ireland, 
we have an uphill struggle to take and retain the position of one of the leading institutions in the kingdom, a position St. Patrick's held more than a century ago. <laughs> the extraordinary things he did with his team were the practical and the grand. He built a greenhouse, introduced fruit and vegetables and lime juice to the diet of the patients. He was very lucky, Lieber was. They'd been forced to buy Edmondsbury Hospital by the inspectors. He welcomed inspectors, and the more critical, the better. He used the inspections to address the needs of the hospital, and he used the land of Edmondsbury to grow fruit. With the fruit, he rid the hospital of the cur curse of scurvy. He hired a hospital maintenance man. He established chaplaincies. Before him, it was thought not good to introduce religion to the ideas of the mentally ill. It might inflame their passions a little. That might have been wiser than we thought. But anyway, he thought better of that and brought in faith as a source of hope. He constructed day rooms, bathrooms, toilets, and a food lift to bring hot food from the kitchen to the wards. The hospital had had huge problems with plumbing due to a basic architectural <coughs> error that had been made by Semple earlier on. 150 years earlier. But he resurrected the idea of sanity being something to do with the dignity of our bodily functions. And in this, he was very well aware of Swift's view about bodily functions, about which he wrote a great deal. But perhaps the most emotive thing he did in practical terms was he bought the hospital's first clock. In fact, he bought three of them, because to come to St. Patrick's before Leaper was to lose touch with time. No war to the clock. It didn't matter. With the clock, he introduced a thing that would be beloved of our finance department. He introduced a length of stay requirement. <laughs> the first, you could not be here beyond three years. If you were going to be here beyond three years, whoa there, it's pretty vicious, isn't it? Three years, what would VHI say about that? I think we should take that to our negotiations, Frank, don't you think so? Um, the reality is three years would very much prove that you were not curable, and he was interested in recovery. He said, there are asylums. I wish they were better, but we are not an asylum. This is a hospital for the treatment, for the diagnosis, and the address of mental suffering to achieve a cure. And therefore, you have a right to time because you're looking at that time just like we are. He established the first training scheme for nurses in attendance. He became ultimately the president of the forerunner of the colleges that we have now. The Medical Psychological Association held its annual meeting here in this hospital at the turn of the century, with all the UK bods coming. This was unprecedented. It has to be said that he was in the context of Trinity, um, and, and he was their choice. He was... Uh, consistent with world psychiatry, which was emerging from the Dark Ages, Kreppelin and Alzheimer and, and, and Golgi in, 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 in Europe. Uh, but also here, um, Henry Hutchinson Stewart, whose bequest ultimately led to, to Stewart's hospital, was recognizing the importance of mental infirmity and the importance of providing proper service, if you like, a medical uh, entity that was credible. But he recruited qualified nurses, and he developed a qualification in a course that was sanctioned by the uh, MPA. He introduced the first hospital pension scheme. Wow. <laughs> Some of the things he has a lot of responsibility for. But wasn't it an extraordinary thing? Pensions were unheard of. If you lived and worked a long life here, you might be granted a pension if you were well regarded and well got with the governors. Whereas he saw that proper remuneration would bring about a proper standard of work. Crucially, he ended the routine use of restraint, building the first intensive care or observation ward um, on the top floor of what was 3B. And uh, he, he did this in an extraordinary way. He found the almost routine use of restraint throughout the hospital when he came here in 1899. He confiscated on his first day 24 straitjackets, and he delivered them to the then director of nursing, the matron of the hospital, and said, they're not to be let out. And she did let them out. And so he sacked her. Um, there was no question about it. She didn't get, she didn't get it. Um, the restraint was not to be used. And if possible, uh, alternatives. And ultimately, he built observation wards and, uh, and introduced to the governors the idea of a non-restraint-based acute mental health treatment. 
He bought the first hospital microscope, introduced the first actual brain research. And Andrew Whiteside has given me some of the interesting, there's very little of, of it published, but there is some record of the kind of um, um, uh, pathological microscopic work he was doing. He gave the first scientific research presentation in the hospital and the first teaching uh, given to the public. Uh, it is, if you like, the first evidence of the hospital actually seeing itself as being a teaching hospital. So what was Leeper's model? How did it extend from the Swiftian one? It was now to be focused on mental illness and not asylum. It was if a national hospital that was to compete with the best in these islands. And its strategy was to be therapeutic. Its organization, structure, governance, and rewards and responsibilities, he enhanced with the Swiftian model in mind. He changed nothing of the structure, and, but went back to it and saw that those on the governors knew their responsibilities and took them seriously. He rewarded his staff, and he remunerated them properly. But he made sure that the principle was one of excellence. He was a competitive guy. He wanted the hospital to be the best in the kingdom. His ethos was certainly humane, but his academic emphasis was on education, learning, research, and teaching. So then what happens? How could he be replaced? And he was replaced by an extraordinary man whom I only knew, unfortunately, in, in his very late life. But Moore's influence was really Lieber-esque and extended this. And it lasted a great deal of time. There will be people here in the room who might have known him. It was through him that the university really got enmeshed in St. Patrick's and in psychiatry as a whole. And it pointed, as a university, its first dedicated professor of psychiatry, Peter Beckett, a man about whom people speak with real affection when you ask them. Tragically, he died um, very shortly after becoming dean of the medical school itself. Um, and his loss is felt still. But during the period of these, these people, the uh, revision of the hospital, the question as to how it should be addressing the national needs took on a really new emphasis. And so during that time, they established the mental health services in the community in what was St. Kevin's and then became St. James's. They, they, it was established and managed from here with full cooperation with the, the national services. And as part of government papers and policies, that was the, the way it was to be. We were to contribute. An arrangement which actually formally only came to an end last year. Moore particularly was keen on establishing community clinics in the hospitals which culturally and historically had been associated with St. Patrick's. And so he established the first psychiatric clinic in, in the Mead, in the Adelaide, in Bagot Street. And many will know that he used these places not just as outreach community clinics, but also as ready recruiting grounds for good medics and good nurses. He would actually encourage people to do mental health and come here from them. And during that time, he and his colleagues rode out an extraordinary revolution in thinking about mental health. And the anti-psychiatry movement's uh, uh, aggressive attack on the establishment of psychiatry uh, needs no further amplification from me. But it, that it existed and that it still exists was something they, they, they confronted as far as they could. And in the context of all the, that debate, I don't wish to add to the development of the story that led to Vision for Change. Vision for Change is the national strategy for mental health. It arises out of an awareness that the asylums are not part of what we want to deliver in mental health recovery. But get this, St. Patrick's never was an asylum. Leeper had closed the asylum. At his height, it had 100 patients in it. The Massachusetts asylum had 15,000. St. Brendan's, Great Gorman, had six. By 1960, 2% of this country were in mental health facilities. You might say they were not in Patrick's, but that was a choice. Could have been. This hospital could have chosen to house and merely contain the mentally ill, but it stuck to its guns and said, we're going to do something different. And it did that in the recognition that mental health was complex, that diagnostics, which were coming increasingly formed, were nonetheless still problematic, and we need to be excellent at what we do. And it did that in the face of continuing ignorance. Think of Dr. Willis in the 1600s, whose view of mental health was that harsh punishment and coarse treatment was the way forward. I don't mean no harm to Minister Tim O'Malley, but his view is an ancient one. There is a strong view with a lot of people that depression and mental illness is not a medical condition. He goes on and he goes on. He says mental health is impossible to measure. It's not science. It's not real, he's saying. 
Years ago, people were unhappy. They weren't depressed. In the face of that cultural institutional ignorance, there is a need for a beacon that can stand up and say, this is a mental health issue that deserves rigor, science, human rights, and intellect, as well as compassion, and is a national resource. And as a result, we've been very proud to be part of the development of Trinity and the confederation of mental health services that has grown from the early days of James's and the Middle Adelaide. And now there's fine relationship through Trinity with Patrick's in the new services that are in St. James's and are in the Mead and Adelaide. And we're as thrilled about that and as enmeshed in those developments as you could possibly be. Having said that, they do then call us to task. What does an independent, charitable, not-for-profit hospital do in the context of the very fine developments of state psychiatry and state mental health? And we did that a hugely painful and demanding, inward-looking, for a while, exercise of examination of our charter. And in Mental Health Matters, we published the first branch of it. And in phase two, we published a second. And these are available to you. And what they say is something quite, quite specific. They say that we will be a model which is in keeping with the Swiftian model, with human rights at its center and in keeping with Leaper's model of excellence and academia. And we will be with our oldest allies in relation, to, in relation to Trinity College, attempting to fulfill the best ideals of a service, looking at model, looking at organization, and looking at culture. We remain independent. We are dedicated to a human rights vision. And we do see ourselves as having a national role, and that there is a justification for a national role. Community psychiatry is not parochial psychiatry. We're not parish punk here. We're talking about a society in the way that Swift understood. And we are dedicated to a not-for-profit strategy. And in every case, we try and make sure that there is no question of bleeding the mentally ill dry, as Swift feared. The structure, the governance, and the rewards and responsibility structures that Swift laid down, they're largely intact, and they have stood an extraordinary test of time. The culture, though, has developed out of a modern understanding of the way in which the ideas which he was so bright in seeing in advance have developed. The recovery model is essential. It is the way forward to see a just entitlement to hope for establishment of independent recovery as being central to anyone's journey through illness. We are dedicated to user-centered involvement. And our ethos remains non-denominational and committed to excellence, just as, as it had been. So now we have multiple uh, approved centers. We're lucky to be in an era like Leaper. We're lucky that there's now a new regulatory authority, a new vigorous charter in relation to uh, regulation and uh, identification of standards. The Mental Health Commission is a fantastic organization as far as we're concerned. And we are recognizing that it puts to us huge challenges. We now have three approved centers, not one. St. Patrick's University Hospital, St. Edmundsbury Hospital, and our Willow Grove Adolescent Center. We have a range of dean clinics because we've said, yes, we have to go out. And we have associate deans, clinics in relationship to that, which we're developing as part of a, a, an extension of this strategy. And crucially, we have a wellness and recovery center, which has doubled its activity over the last two years, and where people uh, attend uh, seeking recovery without ever the notion of being in, admitted to hospital. It is a bright model for mental health, one which has multiple ranges of service, one which is patient-focused, humane, and just, and hopefully, hopefully, never loses its commitment to excellence. The Dean Clinic Network is in numbers of clinics around Dublin, Donamede, Glasnevin, uh, in, in, in Capel, in City Centre, in Lucan, and we're in Cork, and we're in Galway. And these are clinics which are extending their activity and uh, are uh, breaking down the barriers of cost as well. Well, having said that, the memo of understanding which has arisen out of our relationship with Trinity has, has been a way of putting this into charter, into, if you like, the, 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 the print of what this hospital is about. And so the understandings of our relationship have grown since we formed a new memo of understanding. That happened in 2008 and was one of the things that we welcome. And I'm really uh, uh, pleased with the enthusiasm of Professor Gill and others who, who, who saw the wisdom and the benefit of that. The renaming of the hospital was a natural conclusion, St. Patrick's University Hospital. The appointment of, of Professor McLaughlin and uh, the commitment to doing fine research here, uh, albeit 
translated into the network of the university was something that the governors here had the wisdom to fund, and it was the governor's beneficence that made that possible. The formal expansion of the TCD Department of Psychiatry into St. Patrick's with IT support happened naturally then, and the closer links with Trinity Institute of Neuroscience, the appointment of new clinical lecturers, of new research registrars, and the relaunching of Founders Day as an example of an event which can celebrate the excellence of the staff and the work they do. These are all some measures. They don't compare with the huge scale of what Leeper did. They, they're not yet like bringing the clocks and taking the scurvy out of the hospital, but they're a start. And they are an indication of what we are and what we have become, the largest training center for mental health professionals in the country. Undergraduates and postgraduates in medicine, nursing, and, and related disciplines learn their mental health here like nowhere else. Dublin University Rotational Training Program for Psychiatry is the largest in the country, and we have the largest portion of it. Training of professionals in occupational therapy, the first being here under Leeper in 1932, but social science and psychology, and our, our tra training programs in psychotherapy indicate that there's no limited focus of this. This is the full range of mental health. The full multidisciplinary team and the full holistic vision of mental health as being a psychological, biological, and social phenomenon. And the commitment to what we might call translational research goes on. We do randomized control trials here. We have them published. We've got systemic reviews and meta-analyses, a commitment to epidemiology, and health services research, which has service user involvement. We've got interesting studies which are now being funded by the HRB and by our new and redeveloped St. Patrick's Hospital Foundation. Translational Research Award to Professor McLaughlin, um, his uh, very prestigious uh, research fellowship to, uh, to his PhD scholar, Dr. Ross Dunn, and the work of Paul Fearon in relation to the uh, service user involvement are examples. But we've got examples in the dual diagnosis research being done by Dr. Conor Farron's team. Professor McKeown's commitment to the biological and genetic work is, it marries well with the work that's being done already in, under, under Dr. Gill's team and Dr. Corbin's team. But really the idea is the idea that this hospital can provide a bench and an opportunity for what we call translational research. Because the issues have not gone away. Depression in Ireland remains an enormous problem. By 2020, depression will be the second leading contributor to global burdens of disease. With 6,500 admissions for depression alone, the cost to the Irish economy is in billions. And the burden of days lost is in hundreds of thousands. And yet we know a great deal now, which, which Leeper didn't. He could only hope to understand. Which Swift didn't and could only imagine. We now know a whole range of neuromodulatory substances which, gone awry, lead to the phenomena <coughs> of mental illness. That we now have no difficulty in seeing those as being mitigated by social context but manifest by biology and resolved by psychology. There is no division any longer between those who are mindless and brainless. And we need to look at the stress factors and the factors that actually bring about a resolution of symptomatology. And we can do this by studying this kind of work. Here's an extraordinary piece of work that is just a small example, showing the way electrical stimulation, as seen in electroconvulsive therapy, actually promotes the growth of brain areas which lead to, to mental health recovery. How many of you have, will have heard the stigmatic view of mental health that says that ECT is neither effective nor safe, that says it's simply burning the brain? Actually, not, nothing could be farther from the truth. That the neurogenesis, which is important in terms of hippocampal uh, recovery, is actually promoted by mental uh, stimulation through ECS. But this is one example. The idea of translational research, where we see ourselves fitting into the college, contributing to, being a net contributor to the advance of academia and learning as a way of bringing that recovery to our patients and to our country. We see that as our translational position, a blueprint in, which can, involves genetic, peripheral, and psychological markers. And you see we're now at an age where the capacity for the genome and what can be done is so tantalizing and so real. And the work that Dr. Henry mentioned in terms of Trinity's findings around autism is a good example. It's not far. We're going to learn so much more. The effect depth study is a very good example. 
And here we have a study which is looking at longitudinal clinical outcomes in a way that we are able to do because of the structure and the critical mass of our service and the many ways in which it involves the service user. We can look at the response, side effects, the relapse, the, the diagnosis itself, and the neurobiology. And we can come from markers which are derived in the laboratory, and perhaps in preclinical terms, here the mouse being an example, and examine those markers in the human being, modulate them with treatment, and translate that modulation back to the, to the laboratory in a truly self-fulfilling, uh, but I think rewarding, uh, cycle, which actually can deliver uh, a real understanding. Here's an example, coming back to ECT in the work of uh, Professor McLaughlin. It's been clear that the uh, debate around ECT has been about the uh, nature of cognitive side effects as much as anything else. The kind of rigorous, consistent, and um, maintained, sustained study that was possible here has been able to show, in a way which has been published internationally and is, is validated, that cognitive impairments caused by ICT, which do exist, are nonetheless limited to the first three days after treatment. Afterwards, most cognitive functions improve beyond the baseline, and so that the fear of cognitive impairment is not and should not be a reason for avoiding this very powerful treatment where necessary. Similarly, with Dr. Farron and his group, they've been able to combine the academic input and the awareness of the importance of rigorous characterization of clinical material to look at the effectiveness of treatment in, in alcoholism, in alcohol de dependence, and particularly in alcohol dependence where that's associated with depression. And their assessments have been painstaking, rigorous, and now internationally published. And they're one of the few genuine uh, rigorous studies of the outcome of intervention for alcoholism uh, that exist. And we're hoping that great things will come from this study, uh, which has recently been funded by the Health Research Board, which does one of the things we really want to do, which is involve the service user and look at uh, the measures which matter. Three-year study funded by the HRB um, and jointly funded by St. Patrick's Foundation, looking at a brief, user-friendly, patient-centered instrument to, do, to measure quality of care. Quality of care. And Professor Fearon brings particular skills around that area to examine this with his team, exploring the factors, social, clinical, and others associated with high-quality care, and whether they're associated with a better outcome after a period of time. It's true that Swift was obsessional. There's no question that he was obsessional. He was, if you'll allow me one mild joke, obsessional because he recognized that mental health counts Think about it. There is a joke there. The reality is that unless you think that mental health counts, you can't really be in this business. And we believe that we have to get a model. We have to maintain an organization, even with an end that's just dropped out of the line there. And we have to maintain a culture that actually can sustain the challenge for the next 250 years. You've been very good to listen to me. Thank you for coming. Good night. As always, uh, Jim's presentations, given with energy, but not only that, remind us of where this organization has come from. And also, I think, for me, uh, highlight a number of issues around, I suppose, learning <coughs> from the mistakes of the past and learning from the things that were done well in the past. Um, it strikes me, I suppose, Jim, that the, you know, we're, we're very good, I think, as at, in, in the profession of mental health, of, of learning and looking to advance our knowledge, but I'm not so sure we're that good at learning from the mistakes we've made in terms of service development, policy, and legislation. And I think there's a risk, certainly, uh, as we enter times of economic difficulties where some of the lessons we, we should have learned from the past, we don't. And I think there's a real risk now that our mental health services are going to be depleted significantly. Hopefully I'm wrong, but I think uh, some of the lessons haven't been learned. Can I open up the floor to any questions or comments that people would like to make? Um, Yes, Senator. Most of you see about the statement of uh, the Minister of Mali. Of Mali. Uh, Mr. Wood, what did he say about uh, my mental health? 
Well, it's 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 um, it's always unfair to, to quote somebody out of context, and uh, I, I'm sure he meant well. Um, but what he was trying to say, I think, was that in his view, um, mental health, and particularly depression, was not something that was either medical or scientific. And he made comparisons between uh, issues in depression and issues in areas he saw as medical and scientific, clinical in medicine, uh, such as diabetes, um, or curiously cholesterol, which he saw as a marker uh, for a good medical model. Um, I, I don't wish to be unfair to him, um, and he can ask to speak for himself. What I wanted to say is that the powers that be, the establishment, those in charge, uh, no differently than in the 17th and 18th century, continue to wrestle with the nature of mental illness. And we um, need to be part of that debate and not assume that it's over. Have we any other questions? Charlie. Sorry, Charlie. Go for it, Charlie. Go on. I was just wondering about the, um, the American diagnostics and the DSM. Yeah. They're always sort of adding to it and doing various bits. Yes. Is it um, do you think because proper research and experience has looked at something that was categorised as one thing, but then on further analysis has actually then you know, morphed out to be something else? So mm -hmm. that uh, because a lot of people say, oh, we're all living with mental illnesses. Yeah. The unitary psychosis, they were all in one yeah. heap. Yeah. yeah, there's some validity to uh, parting these ways and making sure that there's a proper delineation of, of different syndromes, but it's very problematic. Um, I like to rec recall or remember a, a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, which I was lucky enough to go to, where they were, had a valedictory lecture for a famous professor from Johns Hopkins called McHugh. Of Falstein, Falstein, and McHugh. And McHugh was a, a, effectively a European minded psychiatrist who disliked the expansion of, um, of DSM to ever and ever more small little conditions with uh, very little um, you know, meaning. And uh, he was in debate with Spitzer, who was one of the authors of DSM. And they, they had a, you know, thousands of people in the hall. And at one stage, McHugh said to Spitzer, the only question is, will DSM-5 be bigger or smaller? And Spitzer shouted, it's got to be bigger, goddammit. <laughs> um, uh, but Faust, uh, McHugh got up and said, I'm sorry. Your book has got a challenge. It's got reliability. You can reliably diagnose witches. But I'm used to you, Mr. Spitzer, and there are no witches. And so the problem is that the ever parsing out of different syndromes mustn't be ridiculous. There are New illnesses will emerge, but the illnesses of mental health uh, so far uh, need proper characterization and not confusion by ones which perhaps have less validity than others. So, is there not a um, sort of through to a European model for actually? Yeah, I, I, think, I think ICD is resting with that. I, I mean, I'm in favor of characterization, rigorous description of these things. I think we have to know what we're talking about. We move away from the, from the, uh, from the more, if you like, zany peripheral aspects of DSM. Core of it, I think, is actually so very important. Quite reliable, I think most practical mental health professionals take the centre of it and see that it's valid. The value of it. Have we any more questions? Nobody want to have a row with Jim? <laughs> Not today. Uh, today. <laughs> Manus, go Manus, for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, where do we get a blood test? Check and say, Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, you might want to talk to, to the former Minister of Mali. And, you know, uh, I, I don't know that I look forward to the day of the blood test. I, I wanted to make a case. Really, the lecture, which could have been a lot briefer, really should have been briefer, shouldn't it? I'm going to agonize. It should have been shorter. Anyway, anyway, it, 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 um, the lecture could have been three slides. It was the three zones. I don't want a blood test unless it's got the structure, the governance, the culture, the model. It's about a humanity. It's about a human right. 
and God help us with something. And any, and any, whenever um, somebody's come up with the idea of a blood test, it's fallen not just because the blood test didn't do what it said it did, it's because it failed to do what it ought to do in terms of cultural response to mental suffering. So I, 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 I'm very optimistic about our biology because it's seen in the context of our psychology and our sociology. It's the, it's the collection that we need to do. And that's what I'm saying with the combination of Trinity and St. Patrick's has actually repeatedly, at crisis times, managed to give, bring us back to that rather complex but really hugely sensible vision that says, no, man's a man for all that. It's the whole person that we need to deal with. One last thing about the context of it almost doesn't matter what caused the depression, it will ultimately end up being a biological condition. And that biological condition can be technically curable. Yes, that's a good thing. That would be a good thing. But in fact, here's the thing, it might mean that you've got a new physio for your brain. And it might mean that you actually have to take a new diet for your brain, a new exercise. It might end up like diabetes, you know, where you've got the whole combination of medicine that actually addresses the whole humanity of the suffering. So I, I think that uh, we shouldn't lament the lack of UNO blood testing, although what's going to come out out of the era of genome is going to be extraordinary. And there are people, and I think there's not a lot of just fish, who are going to say, look, we're going to get a barcode that's going to tell you you've got this. I don't know whether it'll be much better than a well-taken family history, but still, we're going to really know an awful lot about the biology, and it's going to make a huge difference. But it won't mean that you abandon the culture, the organization, the model, and the collective address of the human <coughs> Yes, your, your sound book here. Oh, do I? I think the lecture needs more Zane. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> We're just going to bring a microphone because some people want to hear what you're saying. Um, I'll try to repeat that. All right. Um, Start with Zane. Taking on the nations is is is, 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 a, is a perfectly reasonable question. <laughs> the, di the difficulty uh, with that is that um, what you're saying actually is not at all far from what I wanted to convey in the lecture. I started by saying this is remember and spread. One of the reasons I was so keen to have it in this way is it happened by chance. But we're part of history. I also wanted to emphasize the fact that the misunderstanding about the Swiss reference to the nation was so important because what he was say, saying was about commitment to society and to man's right and duty to uh, uh, promote its mental health in that society, health and in general. So I, I do think we're related to past time. And I do think we're at historical time. I don't know whether ultimately the economics of the collapse of the banks will be like the economics of the Act of Union or the famine or any of the other momentous times that this hospital actually witnessed and lived through. I suspect it's right to fear that it might be as powerful as it is that. And I suppose it behoves us to look collectively at what we've learned from the past and 
without sounding too moralistic, but I think there's a lot to be said for sobriety. I think there's a lot to be said for courage in the context of uh, the herd. And I think there's a lot to be said for looking to Swift, who certainly had no time for the advice of the herd or the bankers, indeed, and was skeptical. And, and in his skepticism, um, his what he called his furious indignation, he managed to achieve a great deal uh, at great personal cost. It's not going to be easy. But I think he's a real model. I see him as an enormous patriot. And uh, I think that that would be where I would start looking. Any, any other questions? Charlotte. Just one more to round out, but it's going back to this point on drug tests. Yeah. Is that with all the advances that you're making in the sort of people identifying the genes that might, may or may not cause autism, um, is that better? Much better. <laughs> What you're describing is the risk of a brave new world, a Huxley-like nightmare. Uh, and answering this question, you have to realize, Charlotte, that most of the people who talk to me, and many of them, are in this room. And they know the limitations of my capacity to discuss the genome or their arguments in their education. You don't. You don't. You don't. So, you don't. so, so you don't. I'm going to be very honest, given Ed Lindgren's view uh, about the wisdom of keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> the point about, about the, the thing is, first of all, we can never actually defend ignorance. But the real truth about the biological genetic frontier, that we're actually already crossing, is what people like Dr. Detchen and Gibbon think that it is, is already crossing the frontier, is that it's called to question what we mean by genetic in the first place. Frankly, I didn't mean genetic. Um, I remember once being in London with a man who told me that parenting was genetic. I just think you're an idiot. There's practically nothing in the world of genetic. But the, the ability to hold a note, to hear music with fine precision, so-called perfect pitch, it's genetic. But actually, the ability to get up in time, the willingness to recover, turns out to be genetic. And here's the thing. Recovering actually makes a different change to your genetics. It's a circle. So no recovery happens without genetics. And every recovery that happens, happens because a genetics has been affected. So that actually, while you've got a very, very good reason to be afraid, let's be very afraid. It's not genetics we should fear. It's ignorance. Um, okay, yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> because I said you were doing a bit of a big pollard on this, but. <laughs> um, so it, might, it might be, shall I, you consider that might be my best shot. <laughs> and I, I, Sharon, I'm gonna, I, I'll come back to you in a second. Just, is there any other questions around the room? Yes, yourself there. Yeah. Do you see a day where a hospital won't be required to be treated separately? I didn't hear your question. Do you see a day where a hospital won't be required to be treated separately? No, I don't. I absolutely don't. And, and neither do I. <laughs> I actually don't. I see it being a smaller hospital. I see it as looking quite different. It might actually be what we now construct as hospital. But if we mean by hospital a, an organization focused on recovery, research, teaching, learning, and insisting on a critical mass, a sufficient scale to address that to get results. And by the way, that's what I mean by hospital. I think that's what Swift meant. He could have given his money to a founding hospital. He could equally have said, well, I think Dr. Stevens is a great guy, which he did, by the way. But he didn't. He said, no, they should be adjacent, related, but distinct and dedicated. And that dedication, that commitment, those three zones I tried to emphasize, that's what we mean by hospital. And I absolutely 
I would I would say to the, the country, I'd say we have a chance to talk to the minister or whoever else. Ask yourself whether St. Patrick's and the nation should be part. Would the country be better without an organ of this focus for mental health? Would it be better if we didn't exist? And I would argue that we're not. Any, any other questions, Charlotte? Do you want to make one last comment? It's just on the uh, genetic work. I suppose when I was really also edging, it was how would you protect uh, the person from uh, being a victim of the science? Oh, of, right. of the, you know, you've got the gene, and that's it. I think that comes back to, I mean, obviously you can translate these ideas about model, culture, and organization. Uh, you can translate them to a societal model. There has to be regulation. There has to be governance. We have to have a culture of decisions of what we mean by humanity. You can translate those three questions to the wider nation. And I think Swift is asking us to do that. The king that we did left the better. The only question is, how would we do that? And the, the genetics boys are going to have a real hard time because in their enthusiasm, they may well actually, you know, open a Pandora's box. But my my impression is they understand these risks far better. They're no different than the risks of the early anatomists who did deals with birth and hair. You know, the question really is, the question is, how far do you go? What's the morality of what you do? What's the governance of what you do? But would we go back to a time where we didn't have anatomy uh, understood? And it's only 100 years ago when people had the very same question about the study of anatomy that they now have about the study of genes. Only a hundred years. It's nothing. And the issues will have to be addressed when we have proper governance and proper regulation. And now a, a sensibility about contaminating <coughs> one's body to a medical school, which we have, we've just read now that I think is absolutely wrong. But why is that problem risen? Because of governance, of cultural change, and of addressing the body and making it that it is keeping I think we'll get there with the GM. I have no, I think there's no fear. Um, okay, uh, just before I wrap up, there's one piece uh, uh, of business that, that needs to get done. I'm going to ask Dr. Mary Henry to come back up on the platform. I think she's going to make a presentation to Jim. It's, it's been a great honour for me to represent the College of Life and a great privilege to hear your lecture. I'm sure the association that you described in the past between the hospital and college was incredible, it was very fruitful. And looking, and I hope you take the terse and scenery use, looking at the research work that's going on at the moment, and the clinical teaching that is taking place here, I'm sure the present is assured, and the future will be even better. May I ask you to accept this medal? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. remains for me to wrap up tonight. Um, can I first of all thank everybody for making the effort to get here. It's a cold, windy, drizzly L night, so thank you very much. Um, can I thank uh, Dr. Mary Henry. It's great to have her back. She's obviously welcome to come back and look at all the artwork at another time. And uh, it's great, again, to celebrate the relationship between ourselves and uh, Trinity College. And lastly, um, can I thank Jim. Um, as always, um, a, a, a thoroughly researched extremely interesting and always entertaining presentation and certainly for me it's given me lots to think about and I suppose just to finish up by picking up on one of the last points that were made where will there always be a need for St. Patrick's I think we're moving into an era of human rights I think human rights will underpin any more developments we make in mental health and of course the most significant human right is the right to choose so as long as service users and people who suffer from mental health problems believe that we have a role to play, we will have a role to play. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for coming to me.
announcement. Just just today. Is she got some of it? No, she got some of it. I said, I'm not sure. Okay, so.